Marshall McLuhan has been making people think, laugh, and even worry from the earliest days of television. His arena, the world. Historical period, from the beginning of time. Subject matter, you and I. My guest, Dr. Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan, way back in the early 50s, you predicted that the world was becoming a global village. We'd have global consciousness. And I'm wondering, now, do you think it's happening? Well, you've heard of Julian James, the bicameral mind, and the split up of same, and the rise of consciousness. So your prediction is correct. Um, we're into it? No, the, we, no, no. I think it's uh, now we're, we're playing backwards. We're going back into the bicameral mind, which is tribal, collective, without any individual consciousness. But it seems, Dr. McLuhan, that this, this, this tribal world is not friendly. Oh, no. Tribal people, uh, one of their main uh, kinds of sport is uh, sort of butchering each other. It's, you know, it's a, it's a full-time sport in tribal societies. But I had some ideas. We got global and tribal. We, you know, we were going the to close, become a... The closer you get together, the more you like each other. Yeah. There's no evidence of that in any situation that we, we've ever heard of. That when people get close together, they get more and more uh, savagely uh, impatient with each well, other. Well, why is that? Because of the nature of man? or, yeah, or but His tolerance is uh, tested in, the, in those narrow circumstances very much. Village people aren't that much in love with each other. And the global village is a place of very arduous interfaces and very abrasive situations. Do you see any uh, pattern of this in, for example, the uh, desires of Quebec to separate? I, sh I should think that they are f feeling very abrasive about the uh, English community and about the, uh, the way the, uh, South, the, the American South felt about the Yankee North a hundred years ago. But is it a need for space? Uh, no, it's a need for a less abrasive encounter and more, well, a little more space between the wheel and the axle. When the wheel and the axle get too close together, they lose that playfulness. There's no play and left. And uh, so they, they have to have a bit of oil, a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, distancing from each other and so on. And is this dis distancing, is this going to be a pattern right around the world? Apparently, uh, separatisms are uh, very frequent all over the globe at the present time. Every country in the world is loaded with regionalistic, nationalistic little groups. Even Belgium has a big separatist movement. But in Quebec, for example, they dis define it as the, the quest for identity. Yes, all forms of violence are a quest for identity. When you live out on the frontier, you have no identity. You're a nobody. Therefore, you get very tough. You have to prove that you are somebody. And so you become very violent. And so identity is always accompanied by violence. This uh, it seems paradoxical to you that uh, ordinary, ordinary people uh, find the need for violence as they lose their identities. So it's only the threat to people's identity that makes them violence. Terrorists, hijackers, these are people minus identity. They are determined to make it somehow, to get coverage, to get noticed. And all this is somehow an effect of the electronic age? Oh, no. But people in, in, in all times have been this way. Mm -hmm. But in our time, when things happen very quickly, there's very little time to adjust to new situations I at the speed of light. There's very little time to get accustomed to anything. Would then the, the, the quest for identity of the French Canadians and the kind of inherent violence that you, you speak of that, that's concomitant with that, it would have not come so soon without... Without the, the elect elect electric uh, technology, yes, right? that's true. Uh, things like radio can uh, push people up into a new kind of awareness, which makes it very difficult for them to relate to other people. Uh, I Ireland uh, has mm -hmm. shown uh, many responses to this situation in its relations with North and South of Ireland and its relations with England. I mention them because everybody tends to know a bit about that. Right. And it it's has been irreconcilable. 
in, uh, uh, until, no, until now anyway. The English representing the highly literate society and the uh, Irish representing a more oral and uh, a much more communal, right. tribal group. And uh, where the tribal feelings are strong, radio sends them up the wall. So radio has sent tribal societies around the globe up the wall with intensity of feeling. One of the big uh, violent make, violence makers of, the, of, our, of our century has been radio. Uh, Hitler was entirely a radio man and a tribal man. And what does television do then to that tribal man? Well, I don't think Hitler would have lasted long on TV. Like Senator Joe McCarthy, he would have looked foolish. He was uh, a very hot character. And uh, like Nixon, made, Nixon. A made a very bad image on television. He was far too hot a character. Much better on radio or on, uh, uh, on, yeah, on the movies. Not bad on the movies, which will take quite hot characters. But Nixon was hopeless on TV. <laughs> the, 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 the investigations now of the, the CIA and the FBI and even our own, God forbid, RCMP, is this, has this anything to do with the electronic well, age? Well, yes, because it, we now have the means to keep everybody under surveillance. In any, no matter what part of the world they're in, we can put uh, them under surveillance. It has become one of the main occupations of mankind, just watching other people and keeping a record of their goings on. This is the way most businesses are run. Every business has a huge espionage, espionage sector. And uh, the, uh, this is uh, called uh, public relations and it's called uh, <laughs> audience research. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, around the clock. And uh, th this has become the main business of mankind, just watching the other guy. And invading privacy. Invading privacy, in fact, just ignoring it. It's, it's, uh, everybody has become porous. They, they got, they got the, li the light and the, and the messages go right through us. As, by the way, at this moment, right. uh, we are on the air, and right. we, uh, on the air we do not have any physical body. When you're on the telephone or on radio or on TV, you don't have a physical body. You're just an image on the air. When you don't have a physical body, you're a discarnate being. You have a very different relation to the world around you. And this, I think, has been one of the big effects of the electric age. It has deprived people, really, of their private identity. So that's what this is doing to me? Yes. Everybody uh, tends to merge his identity with other people at the speed of light. It's called being mass man. It began so quite a long time ago. God, save us. New technology, you say, is a revolutionizing agent. Yes, it creates new situations to which people have very little time to adjust. They become alienated from themselves very quickly. And then they seek all sorts of bizarre outlets to establish some sort of identity uh, by put-ons. Show business has become one way of establishing identity by just put-ons. <laughs> and uh, without the put-on, you're a nobody. And so people are learning show business as an ordinary daily way, a way of survival. It's called role-playing. Role-playing has become the normal mode of survival in the business world. Jobs have disappeared, as it were, but role-playing has come in on a huge scale. And it's much more flexible than job-holding. And uh, jobs are rather static, repetitive things, whereas role-playing is very flexible. You can play many roles, but you can only have one job at a time. Now, we've uh, reached a point now where everybody 24 years and under is the TV generation, is, right? Uh, yes. I, uh, do you feel uh, these young people out there, uh, uh, under 24, have been totally tribalized? They have uh, lost uh, their sense of direction. They do not have goals. They don't have objectives. And that is putting it mildly. You think that's new? I think that that is uh, typical of uh, the 24 years and under. And uh, yes, I think that's new. It's, it's, you, it's you say, too, that between today's child, who's been raised electronically and who must still live in a literate world, because we are still in a literate yeah. world, that there's a 2,400-year gap between that boy or girl and his parents. And his parents, who, who grew up in a literate society. 
Well, the alphabet, the phonetic alphabet, the beginnings of Western literacy came in about 500 BC. And um, since then, uh, between then and now, is approximately 24, 2500 years. And we are the first post-literate generation, as it were. That, uh, that is, the, uh, we have bypassed the literate world of hardware and, and the lineal left hemisphere technology. We have bypassed it by moving once more again into the altogether world, the holistic world of the right hemisphere people, who are the third world people. So what is happening to our own children is we're watching them become third world. What does that mean? Well, it means that they, they, they are feel much more groupy and trendy than they do private or goal-oriented. I see. And so the disc jockeys help this along in a huge way. And uh, there's all the nostalgia. By the way, one of the big marks of the loss of identity is nostalgia. And so revivals on all hands in every, in every phase of life today. Revivals of clothing, of dances, of music, of shows, of everything. We live by the revival. It tells us who we are or were. Now these children that are more groupy and uh, less private, are they also more passionate or more violent? I think that the, the sheer dislocation of their lives has put them through a very violent course indeed. They have been ripped off. But they're kind of rudderless. They, they don't have goals. Don't have goals. Because at the speed of light, what is a goal? You're already there. You, can't, you name it and uh, you're there. The violence of the media, you say, itself, invading those not prepared for it. It's not the content that's primary, it's this invasion of privacy that people are not prepared for that is destructive. Had, uh, recently had this trial of the young uh, man who appealed to Koj Kojak right. as his alibi for murder. Uh, this is a pathetic thing because uh, uh, nobody ever mistook uh, fictional uh, entertainment violence for reality. It's impossible. Only people who are leading a merely a drugged uh, fantasy life could do that. And there is the strange factor that television is a quite a po potent drug. It is addictive, it is an inner trip, uh, and it is a tranquilizer. And uh, recently the Detroit Free Press offered $500 for anybody who uh, would, would stop watching television for a few days. And uh, <laughs> they didn't get many takers. But those who did t take up the thing uh, d dropped out very quickly. They couldn't bear it. Do you feel that the fact that you and I are, have enjoyed the rewards of literacy, that we are more protected against television than yes, the Yes, I think you get a certain immunity. Just as you get a certain immunity from uh, booze by literacy. The, the, man, the literate man can carry his liquor, the tribal man cannot. That's why in the Muslim world or in the, in, in the native world you cannot, uh, uh, booze is impossible, it's the demon rum. However, literacy also though makes us very accessible to ideas and propaganda. The literate man is the natural sucker for propaganda. You cannot propagandize a native. You can sell him rum and trinkets, but you cannot sell him ideas. Therefore, propaganda is our Achilles heel. It's our weak point. We will buy anything if it's got a good uh, hard sell tied to it. And so propaganda is the, uh, is, is the great big uh, soft spot in the makeup of the literate man. I see. Electronic people, you say, lose their religion very easily. Well, their attention span is very weak, as you know. The, 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 we have invented the one-liner mm -hmm. uh, in place of the joke because people can't wait around to hear you tell a joke. It takes too long. As for critics, uh, said uh, Sam Goldwyn, don't even ignore them. That's a one-liner. <laughs> 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 and uh, that's all we have time for. There was a wonderful one-liner in the uh, Morning Smile the other day. The teacher asked, what somebody defined for me nothing and a child put his hand up at once and said teacher when you peel a balloon uh, what you have left is nothing <laughs> <laughs> that's a one-liner it's all we have time for attention span gets very weak at the speed of light and uh, that goes along with a very weak identity 
And religion, which involves ideas, requires a little more time. Well, a de religion is a form of indoctrination which requires a considerable amount of literacy. Mm -hmm. You cannot get religion into people minus literacy. And uh, as literacy weakens, people lose their religious affiliations. You've written to or been quoted as saying something to do with criminals in jail who have watched uh, endless hours of television. Now was that a put on? No, that's a little mixed up. What I was referring to was a recent study made in Colorado of the boys behind bars. And the discovery was that every one of them is a dyslexic. This is behind prison bars? Yes, in penitentiaries in, in Colorado. 100% mm -hmm. dyslexic. That is, people with learning dis disabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happens in our world. There have been studies in, 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 here in Toronto and in, in Canada of the same phenomenon. And the strange thing is that 9 out of 10 dyslexic or 9 out of 10 learning disability people are, are boys. Only 1 in 10 is a girl. But what's the relationship with television or watching well, television? Well, there's a, there's a TV is, has a, a strange effect on the eye muscles. It uh, tends to uh, paralyze or to uh, uh, hypnotize the uh, motor muscles of the eyes, so that the, the much, uh, uh, the much uh, television viewing person tends to have a very poor ability to move his eyes on the print, over across the printed word or on the printed page. And he needs exercises to correct this, and the exercises need to be taken quite early uh, while he's in his early years, uh, because uh, the, the otherwise they harden. But the, the ideal exercise for this purpose is the trampoline. <laughs> for, for loosening up the eye muscles. But now, the reason that boys are so prone to this problem, and girls are not, is that the exercises that boys take, hockey and baseball and, and football, these exercises are very crude and muscularly and do not help the eye muscles in the reading activity. Whereas skipping and sewing and, uh, and uh, cosmetics and uh, so on uh, give the girls a much more delicate muscular coordination than boys. And they have less uh, learning disability. I see. What now, briefly, is this thing called media ecology? It means arranging various media to help each other so they won't cancel each other out, to buttress one medium with another. The, you might say, for example, that radio is a bigger help to literacy than television. Mm -hmm. But television might be a very wonderful aid to teaching languages. And so uh, you can do s some things on some media that you cannot do on others. And therefore, if you watch the whole field, you can prevent this waste that comes by one canceling the other out. We have paid no attention to the effects that, for example, as we've just been talking about the uh, effects of television on the, on the printed page. Uh, this radio, movies don't have this effect. Well, they, they don't uh, slow down the eye muscles. Uh, but uh, we have never studied these ph phenomena. But do you, th do you think that perhaps at the end of your studies of media ecology, you're going to advise a cut down on watching television, $500 for anyone who'll give it up for a day? Euro Europeans have cut back on that almost down to nothing long ago because they realized that it thre threatened literate values very much. Uh, uh, an, hour, an hour a week is what about the French, uh, the French uh, child gets for television. Is that right? Dr. McLuhan, you have admitted in the past that uh, you hate to see the upheaval that our world is in. True? I wouldn't say hate to see it, but uh, it, it is uh, a very confusing kind of world in which, as I say, you have no time to get adjusted to anything or acquainted with anybody. You know, we live in a world where one, you meet many, many people per day for the once and only time in your life or their lives. But I'm thinking more about the fact that born in Winnipeg and mastered in English, and English has largely studied at Cambridge for graduate studies, how English was largely your world, and uh, literature, yes. it's been under attack by these uh, new electronic media, especially television. Oh, yeah. um, this been hard on you? Uh, I don't think so, because uh, there is always the challenge of the meeting the opposition head on. And but you uh, wouldn't like to see the, the literate world disintegrate? By no means. I, 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 my, my values are strongly centered in literacy, which I teach day and night, as it were. And do you think it will survive? I imagine so. I think so. It's said, too, that you felt hostile to modern life, mm. that you loathed machinery, and uh, well, you hated big cities. Um, 
Are they? They're talking about maybe a period when uh, I wrote The Mechanical Bride? Probably. It's a little while ago, all right. I, I haven't had much time to feel, have it, to indulge those feelings. Uh, I've been too busy to uh, develop those hostilities. And I've had a wonderful uh, luck in meeting fascinating people and having wonderful students year in and year out. And uh, so the amount of, of satisfaction is huge. And uh, it would be a very selfish thing to blame anybody for, the, for anything else. You also said that you've really never been lonely for a moment in your life. That's true. Uh, I've never had that experience. You describe your conversion to Roman Catholicism in 1938 as a long pilgrimage and a solitary one done entirely by reading. That's, I think, true. Except, again, that I had luck. I met people, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was mainly a literary uh, activity. A book by Gilbert Keith Chesterton, What's Wrong with the World? Yes, uh, handed to me uh, on a Winnipeg street by Tom Easterbrook. Uh, he said to me, uh, I hated this book. I think you'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered, you know, I read some Chesterton myself uh, in my younger days. And I've often wondered if you'd be satisfied with your contribution on a much more global scale than Chesterton's, but seeing, being something similar to his. He was always taking the accepted and turning it upside down and inside out. Having a good look at it uh, from many sides. He was cubist, you see. A paradox is a form of cubism in which you look at the same situation simultaneously from different directions. And, uh, one so there are some parallels there. Oh, between. well, sure. The, the, uh, the habit of, uh, of, of uh, discontinuous and uh, multi leveled perception, but it, it goes partly also with my interest in Joyce Pound Elliott, because right. they, they are also multifaceted people and uh, very right hemisphere people. But the, uh, and, I, I, and Harold Innes. Harold Innes, uh, well, I was uh, very lucky to encounter him. Uh, it was through The Mechanical Bride that I met him, and uh, uh, when I heard that he had put it on his reading list, I was, uh, I was uh, fascinated to find out what sort of an academic would put a book like The Mechanical Ride on a reading, Bride on a reading list. So uh, that's how I went around and met him, and we became acquainted for the few years that remained of his life. He, was, uh, uh, he only had about three years to live at that time. But uh, Innes, I think, is the, uh, only, the only man since the beginnings of literacy 2400 years ago whoever studied the effects of technology and i think that is an amazing thing in view of the numbers of great minds that uh, had this opportunity he is the only human being that ever studied the effects of literacy on the people who were literate and uh, or the effects of anything on anybody mm -hmm. now this as i say is a unique uh, thing in, in Innes's case. Aristotle and Plato never studied the effects of anything on anybody. Would you list The Mechanical Bride and The Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media as the three monuments of yours as far as books are concerned? I have a new book called The Laws of the Media which I hope will be much more attractive. But I'm working on new things all the time. And still looking for pattern recognition? It's uh, one of the big excitements of life. It's a sort of detective activity, you know? The, uh, I, I, I do a lot of sleuthing. <laughs> <laughs> On being a Canadian, I think Northrop Prize says that one of the things Canada gives you is a chance to be an observer. Um, yes, because you're not too deeply involved in other people's problems. And our own problems are relatively small compared to other people's problems. And a certain freedom then? Yeah, it does. And so you can be, be an Ann Landers to the world. What about the multicultured mosaic? That is an amazing uh, ploy uh, to uh, preserve the uh, uh, cultural identity of Quebec and other minorities. It's to, it's the Why end, do you call it a ploy, though? It's, well, it's the end of, it's a, a sort of a, a official ending of melting pot. Uh, the uh, Quebec Corps are fr terrified of uh, being merged in, uh, in the American culture. It's, uh, I think it's as simple as that. that. And I think they're right. They're absolutely uh, vulnerable. We're all vulnerable to the Americans. And uh, they're a very attractive and uh, wonderful people. And I think we could easily become merged in their lives. 
as we intend to be anyway. Well, does that mean that in order to lessen their fears, we attempt to paralyze different well, immigrant groups yeah, coming in at their, yeah, the and, state of their arrival? And keep their cultures intact and separate. That is one of the meaning of the multicultural mosaic. The mosaic is static. It isn't in a state of constant inter, inter, inter inanimation or inter, interplay. No, it's static. And that's exactly the way the French want to be, remain. They want to remain just the way they are. And uh, so it's not that easy. So the, this is an amazing, uh, as I say, ploy developed to um, make this possible. I don't know if it will work, but um, I certainly don't wish them ill on, the, on this uh, maneuver. It is a kind of media ecology, you see. It's a, it's a way of using our available resources in the communication to keep people apart and to keep them uh, intact without merging. So it is, it is a, 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 I think it's a drastic move. I never heard of it occurring in any other country, did you? I never heard of a multicultural mosaic as an idea for immigration. It's, no. a, it's an amazing uh, strategy of survival. Survival, however, is a legitimate goal in life, uh, especially in a fast-changing world. It, and you felt this yourself? Oh, yes. I, I have a, an essay coming out in, in a Harvard book on Canada called the uh, Canada the Borderline Case. It's in a book called The Canadian Imagination. And uh, the theme has to do with the strange effects of b being on so many borderlines in Canada. Mm -hmm. We have so many cultural borderlines in every direction that it is very uh, confusing to uh, uh, the idea of private identity or gr uh, even group identity. But it is a very, very enriching, too, because people on frontiers have a very rich life of interplay with other people, other cultures. Right. I know you don't like to make predictions. I, um, I, I make them all the time, but I make absolutely sure they've already happened. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't like being called a prophet. But, of course, I think in the biblical sense, uh, there was an understanding of a prophet of someone who's not only talking about the future, but is telling you what is happening uh, now. Now, yes, right? the, the present. Would you like to tell us whether the country is going to stay together or not? And thereby be telling us whether what's happening well, to us now? Well, that is a, uh, I don't know if I'd call that a prophecy or not. There is a sense in which the separatism occurred long ago. But, right. the, but there is a hardware sense in which it is still intact. The country is still intact in a hardware sense, legal sense. Uh, it is the hardware, I think, that is under danger under electric conditions. The hardware world tends to move into software form under the spe at the speed of light. That's You're losing me again, Dr. McLuhan. That, so in 15 well, um, seconds, I've got one no, question for you. How no. much television do you watch? Whenever I get a chance. <laughs> not too often. I, mi I missed Rigoletto last night. I was very disappointed. But you don't watch it that often? No, no, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have that many opportunities. I see. Thank you, Marshal McLuhan. I hope you'll come back again. I've really uh, enjoyed well, thank it. Thank you. And thank you very much. And good night. Thank you.